Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, there's just a little bit of chat in the chat box there. Um, that was a long list of objectives. And I thought to myself, as you were talking, Billy, I thought, ooh, I think we should just tell participants to take their bar and just lower it a bit. Um, so hopefully we'll enjoy our time together today. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Uh, I'll just pull up my slides. should be able to see the slides on my screen. I'll be looking over in this direction. That's where my slides are. Um, and you have my permission throughout the session, if you wish to take screenshots of the slides, share them, capture them for yourselves. Uh, and I've already let the team know that I'll send them the slide deck, the final slide deck after the presentation for a full sharing uh, with everyone who's in attendance today or who's registered but couldn't make it. Uh, and it really is an honor to join you today. I'm joining you from my hometown of Calgary, which is near the Rocky Mountains in Western Canada. It's home to the Indigenous peoples of a Treaty 7 region um, and also the home of our Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Uh, and I wanted to start by inviting you uh, to in the chat box to um, just kind of think about, I'm assuming that if you're here today, you're interested in academic integrity. So I'd like to ask uh, you, what do you think of when you, the term academic integrity comes to mind? So, and I'd like to know what brought you to the session today. Why are you here? What would you like to get out of the session? So if I could invite you to uh, just do a little bit of interactivity and join us in the chat box for just a moment, that will help me to um, frame the session a little bit for us today. And I'll just give you a moment to engage. Super, thanks for the responses coming in. We see uh, being ethical, doing the right thing, uh, students doing their own work, giving credit where it's due, students or research, presenting the work of others as your own. Uh, it's about respecting and acknowledging the work of others. Okay, so I can see we have a choir here and we are singing the same song, which is absolutely wonderful. Sometimes when I do sessions like this, um, I hear different things. I hear sometimes uh, folks confusing academic integrity with academic misconduct. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the differences this morning as well. I said this morning, tonight. It is, it is morning where I am. It's afternoon for you. Uh, so today, we'll do that in our time together today. And I'm glad to see these responses coming in. So today, we'll look a little bit at um, academic in, uh, foundations. And then the way I've framed the talk is I've sort of framed it as uh, the beginning of the term or the semester um, and how we set ourselves up to teach and learn with integrity throughout the, the semester and then looking at integrity through the semester through ethical teaching practice. I'm also situated in a teaching and learning center um, and then sort of ending with integrity and I'll address a little bit of uh, breaches of integrity at that time, though we know that breaches can happen at any time throughout the term. Um, and then we'll look at developing systems within our organizations, learning organizations, uh, to recognize academic integrity as part of teaching, learning, and service work. And I'll give you some examples of things that we've done at the University of Calgary uh, and some ideas for helping you sort of take uh, academic integrity work to the next level at your own institutions. Um, uh, Billy sort of went over the, the objectives today and uh, my hope is that this will be a point of departure for further conversation for you as you uh, continue on in this work. Having done a little bit of work with folks in Ireland around academic integrity, I mean, it's amazing the work you're doing there. Um, and in some ways, you're, you're leading the way in terms of um, countries and being proactive with this work, um, with your na national lexicon and some other pieces of work that you're doing. So in Canada, I can say that we are actually looking to Ireland as leaders in this work. Uh, and it's just wonderful to be able to connect with you. You'll see on the bottom of the screen that um, I just, in the interest of uh, being ethical, wanted to share with you that I have presented some of the content uh, for today previously, but I've also added some new things in just for this session today. You'll no doubt be familiar with the International Center for Academic Integrity's Fundamental Values of Integrity courage, fairness, honesty, respect, responsibility, and trust. Um, and I know that you've articulated some of these values in the, uh, the name documents as well. Um, sometimes when I hear of these values, I hear them spoken about in ways that are quite absolute. And that always gives me a bit of pause. Um, I, I see documentation that says it is the student's um, uh, 
uh, responsibility to um, do their own work. It is the student's responsibility to act in honest ways. I don't often see this expressed in terms of responsibilities of educators or administrators. Um, and also in terms of student responsibilities, I often see these values presented as um, sort of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Um, and I like to kind of contextualize them a little bit. And the one that I draw to your attention is that of responsibility. So we'll see things about um, students having the responsibility to do their own work, to act in honest and ethical ways. Sometimes students might also have responsibilities to social or peer groups to help or to share with those groups. And they have to undertake that as a responsibility to the group in order to maintain their social standing in their group. And if they don't help or they don't share, they're at risk of being um, sort of uh, shut out of their social peer group, which can be a very unsettling thing for any of us really, but particularly for young people. And when I speak about youth here, I use sort of the UNESCO's definition of youth as persons up to age 30. Um, and when I talk with colleagues here in North America about this idea of students in peer groups having a responsibility to share with uh, other, other students or their friends, um, sometimes colleagues will go immediately to international students and think about students from a particular culture or a particular country that's somewhere else, it's not here. But there's actually lots of examples within North American culture of where students are in peer groups where they're expected to share. There is a pejorative term that's used mostly in America um, called frat files, short for fraternity files. And it's a fairly long standing tradition in American fraternities and sororities of students being expected to contribute to files for other members of the Greek society. Um, back in the olden days, they would have been paper files stored in, uh, in boxes in the basement of, of the house where the members would live. Um, and over time, of course, those have moved into the internet, into Google Drives and Google folders. Now, I offer this example, which is in no way meant to disparage Greek societies, because I have friends and colleagues who are members of Greek societies. They're much more popular in America than they are in Canada. Um, but to illustrate the point that this idea of student sharing is longstanding, and it existed uh, long before the internet, long before commercial file sharing services, and they were closed groups. Um, but students were absolutely expected to contribute their test papers, their assignments, their um, chemistry labs, and other scientific lab, lab books to the files so that future students could use them. So this became a community of sharing and students were expected to engage in this community in part to maintain their social standing. Um, and so examples like this will point to um, sharing cultures among students that don't exist somewhere else. It's not just among other students, but also among uh, domestic students as well. And I would invite you to think about sharing cultures that you might be part of if you're a student or that you might have been expected to take part in when you were a student yourself. Um, and so these values for me are not absolute, that there are uh, situated values and a point of departure for deeper dialogue, I think particularly with students and for us as academics, teachers and administrators to understand the student point of view. When we engage in those uh, conversations with our students that are non-judgmental, we can start to move away from antagonistic and adversarial relationships with students, but instead engage in a more multi-stakeholder approach where students have responsibilities, but so do educators, administrators, staff, and community stakeholders. Um, and I've differentiated here based on our North American context of faculty being an educator staff, part-time, full-time, uh, and then the staff who are typically non-academic staff here. And I know that there can be some different um, understandings of those terms, so I just wanted to clarify. But the point here is that everyone would have responsibilities. And I'll pause a little bit as well on the idea of community stakeholders. And here I include our alumni um, and, uh, and parents as well. Um, and things have shifted here in Canada with regards to parental involvement with academic integrity. We find parents becoming more interested, um, but at the time when there's been a breach of integrity um, or an academic misconduct, wanting often to become more involved in cases um, and the resolution of cases in favor of their child. 
Uh, this is something that we hadn't seen in decades previous. We've certainly seen it uh, more in the past 10 years. Um, and Don McCabe and others talked about this in a book that Don's last book uh, that he published in 2012. Um, and he challenged readers to think about ways of engaging parents in more proactive ways so that their first entry point to talking about their child's conduct uh, was not at a point of misconduct, but rather ways to engage parents as partners in integrity in the household. Um, and this is something I think we can work a, lo a lot more on uh, in North America, but I think it's in a, parents are an important stakeholder group as well. Um, and so this idea of a wraparound approach for students is one where it's not the students shall do this and then the professors uh, and others are exempt and they can sort of do whatever they please, but rather that we're all sharing uh, different but complementary responsibilities for our students. Um, and you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk today, sometimes here when I talk with colleagues, I'll hear the word academic, the phrase academic misconduct misused. Um, and I'll hear colleagues say things like, oh, I'm dealing with case of academic integrity. And I'll pause and say, I think you're dealing with a case of academic misconduct or a breach of integrity. So it's important to convey to others as they're on their own learning journey that academic integrity is not synonymous with academic misconduct. The, the terms are not interchangeable. And uh, together with a couple of grad students, we put together this integrity continuum as part of an article that we have under review. And we looked at academic integrity as one part of the continuum where we can foster ethical decision-making through educational teaching and learning practices, skill building, communication of ex expectations, but also wanted to acknowledge that there can be a breach. There can be a critical incident that's either an alleged or actual misconduct. Um, and then there is an investigation that would ensue. And if there's been a breach, that's when we would move into the policy and procedure implementation of investigation, case management, um, possibly hearings, sanctions, and appeals, depending on the processes that you have in your university. And then in the middle, there can be this gray area. And this gray area can be at the moment where uh, an instructor might think that there's been uh, misconduct, but they're not really sure. Um, they might seek some advice or report it up the chain, depending on how the processes work at a particular institution. But it's not always so cut and dry that, you know, there's an, uh, just integrity, then there's a breach, then there's an investigation and so forth. But this gray area can be an area of complexity in which students might not understand what's going on and instructors might be uh, trying to find their way as well. And this can also be a time of uh, emotional um, unrest for everyone who's involved in the processes. And we're starting to do a little bit more work here around the connections between mental health and academic integrity, both for students um, and for educators who are involved in, in the process, because there's not a lot of support uh, that we have here yet uh, for those folks who are experiencing um, you know, emotional distress, uh, even for educators around, um, should I report this? Uh, am I gonna be ruining the student's future or in the other direction of anger and contempt that um, starts to well up? Uh, and then that can foster those antagonistic relationships that we, we don't want to foster, but rather support the students. Um, uh, and so, yeah, this gray area is where there's a lot of confusion, um, and this is where processes can help. And I think the place where we have an opportunity to provide the most support for, for our students and educators involved, this is where your processes, uh, your policies and guidelines can come into play. So another question for you folks who are here today, I invite you to engage in the chat. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how are you talking to your students? about academic integrity? Or are you talking directly to and with your students about academic integrity? I'm interested to know what your teaching and learning practices are that you're currently doing now. So I'll just give you a moment to share in the chat box. I see there we've got Instagram stories, um, talking with students, this is terrific. Trying to encourage dialogue in class, it's a slow burner, I agree with that one. Asking students what they think it means, these are terrific. Uh, tell them not to copy directly, they should put it in their own words from orientation onwards. These, this is terrific, basic instruction and induction and informal chats. I think that one is particularly important. 
because so often uh, we will make assumptions about what our students will know or should know when they come to our institutions and we're finding out often they're ill prepared coming from secondary school uh, regardless of whether that secondary school is somewhere else or it's uh, across the street from the institution uh, these are terrific ideas wonderful thanks so much on sharing library resources. Um, yeah, so uh, these are wonderful ideas and I like the ideas that you shared around starting your term with academic or your semester with academic integrity and then continuing it on throughout the semester. So I wanted to share some practical ideas with you um, today about um, talking with students about academic integrity and demystifying it and making sure that it's not a taboo topic. Um, and, uh, you know, th th this is still one of those topics that can be difficult for educators to talk about. So the more that we can make it easy to have the conversation with students in ways that are um, are supportive and uh, not focused on moral judgments. And I'll take a little pause here because I was reading an article by Tracy Bertag, who many of you would know passed away last year, um, and in one of her final articles, in an Australian journal, she talked about different approaches um, between Australia and the United States that I found quite interesting because she said um, in the United States, they'll often deal with academic integrity from a character development perspective or a moral perspective, whereas in Australia, they deal with it as a behavior um, that, that students can learn skills to change their behaviors. And I thought that that was an interesting distinction. If I reflect on our Canadian context, I think we're probably caught somewhere in the middle, um, whereas we have some educators and others that would see this as a character development um, uh, approach and others that would see it as behavior that can be built upon. So I don't know exactly what your take is and on Ireland in that stance and where you would find yourselves as individuals or as institutions, uh, which end of that continuum you might see yourselves at. So I've got a couple of strategies here I wanted to share with you, um, the, five, the five overviews, the five pieces here, and then I'll go through each one, giving you some ideas. And the first one is literally to be straightforward with students, and I'll give you some examples of that. Using humor with your students, even though it's a serious topic, there can be ways to approach it uh, that are humorous and effective for students, being a little bit vulnerable with them, showing compassion, and then showing them where help is available. So I'll go through each of these. Um, and I, again, I see that there's chat going on here and I would love to uh, see more of your examples as we go through. When I talk with my student, I don't beat around the bush. Um, as we say in, uh, in Calgary, in the West of Canada, I shoot from the hip around this. I tell my students that I care about academic integrity and I expect them to care about it as well. In my case, I tell my students straight out, like this is what I study um, and there's very little they could tell me that would surprise me about academic integrity. A few years ago, students were surprised that I had heard about commercial file sharing sites such as Chegg or Course Hero or One Class. Now that we've all heard of those things, uh, they're a little bit less surprised. Um, and we're still building our understanding of contract cheating here around that. But students sometimes think that we don't know about these things. I'm like, yeah, we do. Um, and we want you to know that we know and we want you to care about academic integrity. So often I find I talk with students and they tell me that none of their other professors ever talk about this in class. I'm like, well, in every class we have an opportunity to do this with our students. And I also tell my students, look, if you find yourself to be on the brink of a decision that you might regret later, then just pause and get in contact with me. Um, and although I'm not there 24 seven for my students, um, and I tell them when you go onto a contract cheating site, that live chat box that they have 24 seven, it is no replacement for my office hours where you can get one-on-one -on -one time with me personally. And I'm here to support you through that. If students email, you know, on a Friday night, I might not get back to them until Monday. I let them know that, but that doesn't mean that I don't care about them. Uh, and that if, if there is something urgent that I will aim to get back to them as quickly as I can. Um, uh, and that uh, my, in my classes that I like to keep the focus on learning um, and but in the case of that there is a breach of academic integrity that I'm responsible for reporting it and that is one of my responsibilities as an educator it's determined by our policy, but it's also determined in part by my professional practice. Um, and so I frame this with students from day one, I set it up as uh, just a very straightforward matter of fact approach and, and that we've set the stage for our integrity from day one. 
Now, that can get a little bit heavy. Um, so uh, I also recommend using humor with students when possible. Here, I've got a little video here. Hopefully it, it will play when we were setting up for today. We didn't test it, but we'll give it a try. Um, and it's a two minute and 22 second video. So let's see if it'll work. Oh, it's just taking a moment to render. Can you hear that? No? No, there's no sound coming through, Sarah. If you if you okay. uh, if you want to stop sharing and reshare and just tick to share your sound when you're when you're resharing, then the sound. Sure. Should. So we had our straightforward strategies, and we'll try this again with this video. Ah, and it's not working. That's okay. I'll put it in the chat um, so that you have access to it uh, in just a moment. It's a quick little comedy video uh, that you can use in your classes with your students. So we'll share that with you one a little bit later. And the q and I'll bring up the link. Uh, and so I like to start with this with students to kind of lighten things up a little bit and then get their ideas on what they think um, academic integrity will um, can be used in ways that are not only punitive. I also tell students a little story about myself of a time when I plagiarized happened for me in grade school. Um, and I still remember it. I still remember copying from an encyclopedia and putting it into one of my assignments and not getting caught. The teacher thought it was uh, really well done. I thought I couldn't say it any better than what was said in the encyclopedia. Um, and I still remember because I didn't get caught and I was like, mm, it, didn't, it didn't seem right. Uh, and although that example is from a long time ago, it stuck with me and I share it with students because one, I like them to know that I don't walk into my classroom wearing a halo um, and that this is a, a developmental approach to, um, to integrity and learning. I never told the teacher. I think the teacher's long since retired now uh, and never knew. Um, about it. Uh, and, and this was a case of uh, now that I'm an educator that I pay attention to because so much of our um, academic misconduct goes unreported. But the fact that I still remember it all these years later is kind of stuck with me a little bit. And then I tell students, well, um, I learned from that that I really did want to do my own work because I didn't feel very good when I got the grade. So I try and end on a little bit of a positive note with students. Um, and, uh, and let them know that uh, we all make mistakes and that we, as we go through and learn, then we learn how to do things better, right? There's that saying by Maya Angelou that when we know better, we do better. Um, and so to connect with students on, um, uh, on a positive note, uh, that's also personal and, uh, uh, and you know, doesn't, um, doesn't convey to students that it was okay. Uh, I tell them, you know, of course this wasn't okay, um, but that I'm here to support them with that. And then showing compassion to our students as well in the form of formative assessment for them. I used to be at the beginning of my teaching practice uh, in the early 90s, one of the most militant people in terms of um, deadlines. And I would say to students uh, that, you know, this is part of learning to grow up. And this is an expectation when you get into the real world and get into the workforce, no one tolerates you asking for extensions. And then I became an academic. Um, and I'm, I typically ask for extensions all the time now with my, my committee work and my publications. So I do this uh, in my own work and I think many of us do as academics. Um, and so I like to offer the same compassion to my students. And I have a colleague here who offers her students a get out of jail free card. Uh, and so I'd like to give her a shout out with this. She puts it in her course syllabus and says to the students, you have one get out of jail free card per term. And that get out of jail free card gives you a one week extension on any assignment, no questions asked, and you can use your card at any time of the term. And she tells me that actually very few students take her up on it but knowing that they have it brings them great relief and that they find it very supportive from the beginning. And she said, well, it doesn't, um, it doesn't really uh, make that much difference to her one week, one way or the other, but it's her way of establishing with her students that she will give them some leniency and won't um, uh, in include additional punishments in, by way of insisting on long elaborate explanations in terms um, in exchange for concessions. She says it's no questions asked and she stands by it. So the students don't have to come um, and either provide medical notes that they may or may not have forged or provide long explanations. She's like, the explanation doesn't matter. You need the extension. You're here to learn. I'm here to teach you. Uh, and so I'll support you with that. This is all part of an approach to put dignity before deadlines. 
Um, and it's an approach that I've grown into through my teaching practice, and I've become a lot less militant with regards to those deadlines as an educator, because um, I also know that the more I emphasize deadlines, the more I might be driving my students into the arms of contract cheating companies where it is exactly where I don't want them to go. Um, and so I'm putting students first with this one. Uh, thank you for the, for the note in the chat box there. And I think, well, I would I think I would have loved to get out of jail free card as a student. Um, I also think that we've shifted a lot as educators from the time that perhaps when we went to school um, and we can be a little bit more compassionate with our students now. And then finally, showing students where to get help. So uh, some activities I know that colleagues do here, they will do either a virtual or on campus treasure hunt with students where they're having them do a bit of a web quest or walk around to different offices with like a bingo card or a treasure hunt uh, as to where they can get their academic integrity resources and then have students come back and then either present to the class one resource that they found um, or create a little video or a PowerPoint presentation that they can then submit as an assignment. And when the students can go and get um, as, uh, resources and engage in help seeking behaviors in a sort of simulated way as a class activity, uh, then, then it's not so scary for them when they might actually need the help or the resources later on in a just in time situation. Um, but literally showing students where to get the help before they need the help um, can be a way to support them with this. Um, and so it, building it into class deadlines as well. So many institutions now will have an academic integrity tutorial that might be pre-arrival or it might be part of an orientation. Um, and I would like to caution, these can be excellent ways to introduce students to um, academic integrity. And as long as they have a focus on education and not only a policy focus, so that it, it's meant to relieve students of the opportunity later to say, oh, I didn't know, because then we could say, well, you took the academic integrity tutorial, you should know. But we know that um, students will need to practice their skills and that a one and done approach simply won't work but engaging students to go and um, find these resources and also engaging them in creating resources um, is, is a big part of this as well. So I'll move a little bit away now from um, uh, the student activity or the student focus and talking to students um, at the beginning of the semester. And I wanted to ask you now about what are your recommendations to support instructional integrity? And I'll use that, that, that phrase there as a complement to academic integrity because instructional integrity can, can be what we do in our classes. So uh, what do you do in your classes? I'll leave the chat open so that you can continue to share your thoughts around this um, and then wanted to share with you um, a phrase coined by a colleague, friend and colleague here in Canada, Julia Christensen Hughes. Uh, she did some work with Don McCabe when he was alive, uh, looking at academic misconduct in, in Canada um, and came up with this phrase at the end of it that students cheat when they feel cheated. And the example that she uses in some of her talks is when instructors, for example, recycle their assessments, um, that from year to year that students feel cheated because the, the as professors then we're not putting the time and effort into re, re, uh, refreshing our own assignments and making them new and interesting for the next group of students. And um, assessment recycling was one of the key things that they identified that bothered students uh, with regards to instructional integrity because students then saw their professors as being lazy and disengaged and not caring about them, which might be uh, some of the same views that professors would hold of students when students are engaging in cheating behaviors. Of course, we don't want to propagate the antagonistic approaches, uh, but this idea of instructors having responsibilities uh, that are related directly to instruction and assessment to uphold integrity as part of their ongoing teaching practice. Now, we, uh, I, I assume that in Ireland and Irish universities, you also have the concept of academic freedom, uh, as we do here, that can make it very complex uh, in insisting that instructors change their assessments every year. We're starting here to push conversations um, 
that academic freedom doesn't mean uh, doesn't mean that we have we can be academically lazy um, or or ethically corrupt, which is effectively what uh, recycling assessments means uh, for students. Um, and the idea of authentic assessment is coming up more and more as a way to engage students uh, in new and fresh ways around uh, their learning that can support integrity. And if you listen to Kath Ellis from uh, Australia, she will tell you that we can't design out cheating, but we sure as hell can design it in. And so things like using multiple choice timed exams in online environments where we know that uh, it's very easy for students to take screenshots and then plop those into one of those shared files um, is a way of uh, designing in cheating. Um, and and we, I don't think we have concrete evidence around this yet, um, but we, are, we certainly have anecdotal evidence to show that within 10 or 15 minutes of an online assessment being posted, that the questions and often the answers are available online. And so this is just a reality of the world that we live in that we need to be aware of. Um, and also um, as well, I think it's important to acknowledge that we live in a sharing culture. We talked a little bit about that in sort of the old school um, frat, frat, frat files, the fraternity files. But also when we go into online contexts that we are sharing constantly, we're sharing photos, status updates, means I do it, you do it, our students do it. Um, and so the idea that we can share for everything except learning has become problematic because we've taken normal online behaviors sharing and we've um, cr almost criminalized them. So a question that I have for you here, if you're an educator, is how can we uh, reframe normal online behaviors as normal learning behaviors? And what, uh, what are the conversations that we need to be having around collusion uh, that might not actually be seen by our students as collusion? There might be things that cross the line, working with uh, contract cheating companies in uh, cheating rings where students are working with one so-called tutor who's giving them real-time answers in an exam, certainly crosses the line. If students are sharing their own notes or collaborating with one another without engaging with a, a third party, is that something that we need to rethink? Um, and many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with the work of Trisha Bertram Gallant um, in the United States, and she challenges us to reframe the driving question from why are students cheating to why aren't students learning? But that question I would add on to that is, if students are learning, are they cheating? Uh, and it's a question that we continue to grapple with here as students used to gather in our libraries and other spaces face to face for their study groups and those study groups moved online for us they continue to be uh, online and even though some universities have gone back to school face to face students in some ways are not going back 100% to the way things were necessarily, they might still be gathering in online spaces in synchronous ways through zoom sessions or asynchronous ways through their WhatsApp groups or their discord groups, some of which can be infiltrated, we know, by contract cheating providers, but not all of them. Some of them are legitimate, and some of them are students themselves trying to create community. Um, so another question as you're grappling with this is, what's the difference between collusion and learning in community with others? I'm not sure we've answered that question here, but it is one that we continue to pose as we want to create um, a shared responsibility model around academic integrity, rather than again, antagonizing students. So when we have students in the middle of this model, we know that students are not a homogeneous group, but that there's, they are individuals and they then will gather in their own little micro groups uh, based on their discipline or students, other students with whom they just like to work. Uh, and that these are small little ecosystems of learning. And there need to be ways for us to support this that are ethical. One thing that we're considering here, we haven't quite got there yet, but we're working on it, is creating safe sharing spaces for students within our own learning management systems. We're talking about using Teams because that's the learning management or one of those systems that we think can facilitate this, um, whereas our learning management systems are actually quite behind in their design and development and don't yet have opportunities for students to engage in safe online sharing spaces. Um, so this is one of the reasons that students are turning, we believe, to commercial contract cheating companies is because we are failing to provide them with opportunities for them to share in real time 
what you can do in Teams through Teams chat or in asynchronous manners. Basically, students need spaces and places to connect with one another. Um, and if our libraries and other study spaces on campus are not available to them, we as institutions need to think in more innovative ways about how to support them in the digital spaces that we know that they will occupy. And also, if they are in these spaces, uh, to work with them uh, in ways that they can engage ethically rather than simply saying, no, you can't use WhatsApp because it's not an approved technology through our institution. But if we're not offering them a viable op opportunity to engage in similar behavior of real-time text chat, which we all use on our phones in different ways to communicate, if we're not offering that to them, are we the ones who are not acting with integrity? Um, so these are big questions for institutions because it involves new technologies, new ways of thinking, new ways of supporting students. Uh, these are the things that we will have to grapple with if we really do want to support students through a teaching and learning lens uh, for academic integrity. And we know, of course, that uh, integrity can look different in different size classes. So one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, what are some of ethical principles for assessment that can be applied in any class regardless of discipline or class size. So I wanted to ask you your opinions about these. And I'll just give you a moment to engage in the chat. And I really like the suggestion that's come in here about building in more creativity and flexibility and how students are demonstrating learning group work assessments uh, and where students play roles that are suited to them. I think this is actually spot on uh, and partnering with students in assessment for sure. Um, and the idea of building the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage um, and also considering um, alternative and authentic assessments. And I was so proud to see that you have the, this resource already or one, or one resource um, through your ethical teaching and practice with your academic integrity principles and design documents. I had a look at this as uh, someone from the outside and I have to tell you that I was super impressed with this resource that you already have for your teaching staff. I think it could actually serve as a global exemplar of excellence that others could follow um, in terms of promoting academic integrity through eth uh, ethical assessment uh, and promoting instructional integrity as part of academic integrity. Um, and as uh, other universities we know have created other similar resources, we know in the end that it's not enough for resources, resources to exist, but faculty know have to know where to find them, as do students, um, and in, encouraging faculty to engage uh, in the development of their own resources, I think can be a very powerful approach, because it's then peers sharing with peers rather than top-down approaches. Sometimes the top-down approaches can work well, um, but the peer-to-peer -peer share sharing can also work really well and leveraging your own internal expertise. And based on the number of people that are here today, I would expect that uh, at your institutions, you have small, again, sort of micro ecologies um, of people who are willing to champion this work over time um, so that this work continues to be refreshed um, over time as well. And I think one of the things that I've been inspired by is um, uh, in, in recent years is seeing students as partners in academic integrity. So it's not information that we're providing to them, we're not preaching to them, but instead flipping things around so that we are supporting them uh, to lead campus-wide uh, awareness campaigns and activities, even at the departmental level. Um, uh, you know, thinking about things at the departmental level, uh, this is where our disciplinary expertise can reside, but it can also be um, uh, an area of constant change as departments undergo reorganization. And so at, at the department level of a university, I think sometimes it's the, not the professors necessarily that can run the workshops for the students because so many of our professors are overworked and doing so much committee work, but if we can flip it around and instead provide students with the resources to run the workshops and to support them, um, then they will actually take the lead in this. And it's so exciting to see when students are leading the way with this work and as well providing uh, training for student teaching assistance is uh, very important and seeing them as uh, partners in all of this work. 
and when we're undergoing policy revision, I, I hope that you have students on your committees in both formal and informal ways and that they have a voice at the table. Uh, and not only a voice, but in some committees a vote uh, as well when we're determining whether policy should be adopted. Uh, and in so many places that, again, the student relations with the administration can be sometimes strained. And the more that we can overcome that work on building strong relations with our students and student governments, the more I think that we're building relationships of integrity across our campuses uh, that go beyond our classrooms. So just going back to the um, continuum here that we have around the foundations of academic integrity. We've been talking a lot about the teaching and learning piece of it, um, but there is uh, just that moment when we think that there's a breach or, or an allegation uh, that needs to be addressed. And I always tell people, this is the other part of the job um, and it's not all rainbows and unicorns and that when there are breaches that I'm expected to, to report them. Um, and this can be part of our internal processes as well. We know that through decades of research that faculty are often reluctant to report academic misconduct, but that establishing clear policies and processes can help. Um, Rebecca Moore Howard uh, talks about um, uh, not having a finding or a finding of misconduct can be a quote unquote academic death penalty. Um, and more recently, Kath Ellis in Australia um, advocates that an, a finding of academic misconduct should not be a catastrophe for a student. And thinking about ways where we can create situations where if there's been a, mis a misstep um, for students or misconduct, that it's addressed and we learn from it and we go on again, sort of treating it as um, part of the learning process and going from there and ensuring that the process for students is also clear and transparent and that there is support available for them either through an ombuds person on campus who can explain policies and procedures to them or through a student advocate um, who is uh, an employee of the institution even though they're called a student advocate they're an advocate for students um, and to help them understand their position having uh, a role such as this in a university i think is critical um, either an ombud who's a neutral person or a, or someone who works specifically as an advocate for students can help them navigate these complex processes and support them through the learning and if these are positions you do not yet have at your universities to support academic integrity, then I would encourage you to consider them as part of your institutional approach, um, because we know that this can be confusing for students, terrifying for students, uh, and helping them navigate the waters is, is a, another important aspect of integrity for them. And then finally, for our academic colleagues when they're engaging in this work, and we know that this can be difficult work for academic colleagues as well, that there's emotional labor involved in reporting academic misconduct to ensure that our colleagues are supported. And I'll share with you um, an example that we have at the University of Calgary that I'm actually super proud of this work that we've done this year. If we really want to promote academic integrity through a multi-stakeholder approach, that the academic work and the labor around this must be recognized. And now we have at our institution level, we call this our academic staff criteria processes handbook. Basically, it's the big handbook that academic staff adhere to. We have just this year officially recognized academic labor um, as part of academic work through teaching and service. Um, and I'll actually give you the wording that we've got here. I've highlighted this. This is now an official policy that's been accepted at the highest levels. So that uh, what, does it, what does teaching look like? We're a research intensive university. The reality is that very few of us are researching academic integrity, but to include this as an official teaching activity is was for the first time, I think we're actually the first Canadian university to do this, means that this now gets included in teaching dossiers, which for us are mandatory documents to provide if we want to apply for tenure or promotion, um, as well as we now have mechanisms for people to report this for their annual performance reviews, which for us happen every two years. So if people are developing new activities, for supporting academic integrity in their classes, um, that this can now be documented and shown and valued as part of academic work. We did this in part to respond to um, 
little quips such as I can spend three hours, you know, working on academic integrity activities, or I can spend three hours working on a research manuscript, what's going to get me further in my career. We wanted to disrupt that dialogue and show people that this is a valued part of academic labor and to recognize it through teaching and service. So there's teaching and then there's service. You can see it's got a little bit more prominence there in the service section of what we do in addition to committees, et cetera. Um, but the activities that contribute to upholding academic and research integrity, including dealing with cases of misconduct are now recognized as official activities under service as well. And again, people can document it, put it in their annual reports, uh, and, and it is now a requirement that that work be recognized. So as we want to create these cultures of integrity, it's important to recognize the efforts of everybody involved in our campuses in different ways. So we'll look at those foundations and values that we have as a wraparound approach for students to um, challenge antagonistic or adversarial responses, but instead take a supportive approach for everybody on our campuses, that we can start our semester with integrity by talking to our students straight off. We can build integrity into our approaches to ethical assessment um, and resist uh, practices, longstanding practices, such as the recycling of assessments, um, engaging students with partners, and then knowing as well that we have the systems and processes in place to deal with breaches when and if they occur. And then after the semester, providing our academic staff with um, ways to document their academic integrity labor and work so that it can be recognized as a valued part of the profession. Um, and so those are uh, all of the points that we've covered today. I hope that we've taken you on a journey uh, of academic integrity through the term and that you've got a couple of ideas that you can take away and start using in your own teaching practices. And I will hand things back to, um, I think I'm handing things back to Billy for the next steps and happy to take questions. We're going to hear uh, something of the student voice in, in this. And uh, Kate Goodman, DCU Students Union, um, Vice President for Academic Life, is going to say a few uh, words. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Billy. Um, so like Billy said, my name is Kate Goodman, and I work in the Students Union, um, representing the 8,000 students here in DCU. Um, my remit is um, academic life of students. So obviously academic um, integrity is such a big part of my role. And um, so that is why this week with DSU, um, we ran an assignment 101 week is what I'm calling it. Um, and we're kind of thinking of how we can engage students with academic integrity. We were going to run events, um, but then talking to Rob and then other um, people within the university, we kind of agreed that Numbers wouldn't be that high for in-person events, but um, I think I'm really happy with how the Instagrams are going. I think they are very informative. Um, but I did want to touch on a few things that um, Sarah had said, um, especially just on um, staff responsibility. Um, I think it is definitely multi-stakeholders um, approach. Um, I think students definitely do have responsibility. I think Sometimes when students are in a position, when they feel um, vulnerable and they feel as if they don't know how to go forward, that having um, assessments designed, first of all, maybe in collaboration with students is so helpful. But additionally, um, just simple things like sharing a rubric or giving a little more of a detailed brief really does um, set students up to approach their assignments um, and also having pointers on the loop page. I know that's what we use in DCU. So additional resources really do provide students with everything they need to complete their assignments. Um, yeah, I did want to touch on the expectation to share, which I thought was really interesting. I've never really considered that before, but I, the last few weeks I've been dealing a lot with teachers, because that's in their mind. Um, and how they, how they work with lesson plans. And they were kind of saying there's a few very lines because obviously if there's a good lesson plan of course you're going to take it of course you're, you're going to want to implement it in your class but you can take credit for that work um so i do see why they'd want to share that work and why they'd help each other um but i do think maybe it's something we um in dc you need to look at like, explaining what is and what isn't acceptable when it comes to um sharing work um 
yeah, I just wanted to note that um, while I was in the, while I was making online content for this week for the assignments one a week, one week to purposely coincide with academic integrity week, I myself personally um, was approached to social media via contract cheating um, Instagram page. Um, they are very, they're, they're very prominent. I'd say in my last four years in DCU, I have been contacted at least five times by these um, pages from us, I think that's appropriate to call them. Um, and it is scary. And I do think students are in a very vulnerable position and they will, they take advantage of those students' vulnerability. So I really do agree that um, students need to feel safe and secure in DCU to trust the system, like Sarah was saying, and follow the processes for extenuating circumstances, to feel comfortable asking lecturers for more details on their assignments, and to maybe ask for rubrics or maybe even extensions. And in my experience, DCU staff are very much open to that. Um, it's just maybe something we can work on more, maybe advertising more that extenuating circumstances is a possibility and maybe working more with our class reps um, to negotiate with staff um, about making sure assignments aren't all bunched up together so students don't reach that point of anxiety and stress when they feel like they have no other option but to use those services. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, another point that I wanted to bring up was that um, myself and the president of the student union, we work on the disciplinary um, committee. Um, and what we have found is that a large proportion of the students that do attend the committee are international students. Um, and I think there is, it wasn't, uh, there is different cultures to what is, is and isn't accessible in different um, cultures. So maybe it's something that we, again, in DC can look at at educating our students that what is and isn't acceptable um, when completing their assignments. Um, but yeah, overall, thank you for letting me speak and thank you, um, Sarah, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I, um, I think you're right in pointing the finger back at staff responsibility in this, right, okay, and in some sense that's the way we want to I think, or have to change the narrative uh, on this. Um, I, the lesson plans example you, you gave is a very interesting one because there's, there's a legitimate market in that where, where practicing teachers sell them to one another. But if students engage with it, it's, it's, it's not deemed right, uh, appropriate. Yeah. Um, they, uh, um, I'm very much taken right okay with, uh, Sarah's view on, on the deadlines. And um, uh, I think all of us probably have, have had experience of, of dubious um, certificates or dubious reasons, right, okay, for deadlines. And I think that idea of dignity before deadlines or even integrity before deadlines is actually a, uh, one to take on board. And pick out one thing from, from the chat earlier was out comment right, okay, that, that Brie Lane made right, about teaching students to value their own work. And I think this is really, really what's, what's important. I think um, particularly for students, for students at, at the early stages in their, in their engagement uh, with uh, higher education or even with, with Irish higher education institutions, they don't always value their own work. And, that encourages them, right, okay, to engage in what, what we interpret as academic misconduct, but actually a lack of confidence, right, okay, on, uh, on their part. 